In this video, what I want to do is go over some tips that you can use for the law of sines as well as the law of cosines. So the first tip that I have for you is always write your triangles the exact same way. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, a lot of times when you're given a problem for law of sines and law of cosines, you might be given some side lengths and, an, and a couple of angles, and you need to create your own triangle. So when I'm doing that, rather than trying to create different triangles, different orientations, I always like to redraw them the exact same way. Even sometimes if you're given a picture of a triangle and it looks confusing because it doesn't look like the way that you did problems in your own class, I always just rewrite them to make sure that they kind of fit in this exact same orientation. And that orientation looks like this. So here would be an example. What about if I had A equals five, B equals six, and A, the angle of that, is going to equal to 30 degrees. Well, when I am identifying where I want my angles and my side lengths to be, I always like my angle to be in this left-hand corner. So this is going to be my 30 degrees. Then obviously remember that anything opposing our opposite of your angle, so therefore this A has to equal five, and then to understand the ambiguous case, which this is actually an example of, I always like to have that side length over here. A lot of times we have ABC, right? I get it. But when I wanna make things not confusing for me, I like to always have things written the exact same way. So therefore I'm gonna make this big B, this little C, big C. So therefore my B in this case, side length B is going to be right here. Now there's another way you might say, well, what about if you have a obtuse angle? Then I'll do the exact same thing. I'll make sure whatever angle I'm provided is going to be right here for my obtuse angle. And then I always like to have the, you know, the side lengths that I'm given going to be next to that angle if need be, okay? That helps out with confusion a lot of times because sometimes when I'm visualizing, especially like the ambiguous case, it gets confusing when you have triangles that look different ways. So I always rewrite them in this kind of format and relabel them if I need to, just so I can have angle side side look like this. Now, the next tip comes into when we're doing with the law of sines and also when we're doing the law of sines with the ambiguous case. And that comes into always solving with the unknown in the numerator. Now, it's okay if you weren't paying attention and you didn't write down this tip, it happens. This isn't the biggest tip that I would say that's going to make or break your grade, but in my opinion, it's really helpful because it can shave some time off when you're taking a test or a quiz and also lessen the steps that you have to do, so therefore you sometimes could make a mistake. So a lot of students, when they remember the law of sines, they remember it as A over the sine of A is equal to B over the sine of B. And again, remember the capital A and B represent the angle, and the lowercase a and b represent the side lengths. Now remember, this relationship is also equal to c over sine of c. But the one relationship a lot of times students forget is you can simply just reciprocate this relationship and the law of sines still holds true. So I could say this is also equal to the sine of a over a, which is also equal to the sine of b over b, which is also equal to the sine of c over c. Now, why is this so important? Well, when you're solving for a missing value, you don't want that missing value to be in the denominator. It just adds more steps and it, you're more likely to make a mistake. So let's go and take a look over at this example that I drew right here and say, all right, well, can I create a relationship here with my unknown in my numerator? So I have an angle, a side length, a side length, and you can see I have a missing angle. So I can create this law of science relationships from the information I'm given, right? However, I don't wanna use this relationship. Since my angle is what's missing, I'm gonna to wanna to use this relationship over here where the sine of the angle is in the numerator. So therefore I'd write it as sine of B all over six is equal to the sine of 30 degrees all over five. Now I can go ahead and multiply six on both sides, take the sine inverse, and I can find one of the values of B in that case. Now, sometimes we get a different relationship. Maybe we'll have an angle or a triangle that looks like this. Let's say we put our 30 degrees here, and that's still five. I have the angle. Let's do this as 40 degrees. 40 degrees, and then this would be your missing C, B value. Okay, so what about if I had something like this? Now you can see I have two angles, but I don't know what this missing side length is. So in this case, I would use this relationship. Whereas now I'm going to have the missing side length as B over a sine of 40 degrees is equal to this side length, which is five, all over a sine of 30 degrees. So this is something that's very, very helpful when you're dealing with the law of sines is always have whatever missing value that you are looking for. If it's a side length, make sure that's in the numerator. If it's gonna be an angle, make sure that's in the numerator. 
So again, either one of these relationships is going to work for the law of sines. Just make sure you always solve with that unknown inside the numerator. But this is the case that's gonna come up with tip number three, because this is the ambiguous case. Because when you solve for B, there's a way that you can identify if it's one, two, or no triangles when you solve for B. All you simply need to do is subtract it from 180 and see if it works. But I'm not gonna lie, a lot of students forget it. A lot of students interpret it incorrectly. And when they have a test or a quiz, they just all of a sudden forget about it. So my next tip is to what I really like to teach my students and for them to practice. I think it just makes a lot more sense and it's a lot more efficient. And that is to go ahead and use the value H to identify the ambiguous case. So what's so important about H and how can we do it to help us understand the ambiguous case? If you look at when I created H, that is going to be the representing the height of the triangle. I also created a right triangle, right? So I have this angle, I have the opposite side of that angle, and I have the hypotenuse of the angle. So therefore I can write a relationship here that would be the sine of 30 degrees is going to equal an H over six. Or solving for H here, I can say H is going to equal a six times the sine of 30 degrees. Now we can go ahead and find the value of H. So the sine of 30 is going to be one half. So one half times six is going to be three. So H equals three. So what does this tell us? Or how can we use the value of H to help us identify what are going to be our two situations? So it does take a little bit of remembering, but I always just like to visualize things, okay? And here's the way I like to visualize things in this case. Forget about our H for a second. If I know my A is greater than my B, I'm going to have one case, right? Because if you think about this, if this A is so large, then it's always going to create a one triangle. It's never gonna make that two case scenario. Conversely, also, if A is less than H, then you're gonna have no triangle. How does this make sense? Well, let's pretend my H, or let's pretend my A was so small. Let's pretend it was, it was like this. No matter how much I rotate this round, it's never gonna create a triangle, right? Because remember this angle here, this 30 degrees is fixed. So if I have a A, let's say is like one, it's never going to be long enough to intersect with this line AB. So therefore it's never going to create a triangle. Now, the one time where we do get our two case solution, and obviously when H is equal to A, then you're gonna have a 90 degree triangle, which would also be a one, one triangle. But the one time when this comes is when my H, my A is going to be less than my B, which in this case is my side here. So my A is going to be less than B, but it's going to be bigger than H, right? So that happens, and that is when it creates this two case scenario. Because now you can see my five is less than my B, but it's greater than my H. And what happens when we have that scenario going on is now we've created this two case scenario. And again, remember going back into my initial tip, I always love drawing my triangles just like this because I always like visualizing it like this. I don't want to try visualizing the ambiguous case with like a, a different type of triangle. I like visualizing like that. And I know a lot of times in your notes, you'll see C is used in this definition and that's fine. Rewrite the triangle however you need to so you have it as angle side side. The letters don't matter. You just need to make sure you understand that when your opposite side is longer than this adjacent side, you're gonna have one triangle. When your A is equal to your H, you're gonna have one triangle. It's gonna be a right triangle as well. When your A is less than your H, no triangle can exist. And when your A is greater than your H, but less than this adjacent side, you're always going to have two triangles. And I think once you just work through a couple of these problems and not trying to do the law of signs, go through like subtracting from 180 and testing to see if it works, this just makes sense. It also, in my opinion, is just much more efficient. So that's enough with the law of signs. Now let's get into some fun stuff with the law of cosines. So when you're dealing with the law of signs, which we talked about in the first three examples, you have to have a relationship. You have to have a ratio of a side length with its angle. And as long as you have one of those relationships and you have another missing part, then you can use the law of signs to find your missing angles. And that's all great. A lot of students love the law of signs. It's easy to remember. It's pretty easy to compute, but we hate the ambiguous case. Because if you've ever gone through a problem with the ambiguous case, it can just be confusing. It's a lot more work and we just wish everything was simple and we could always avoid ambiguous case. So my next two tips with the law of cosines are all about me helping you avoid the ambiguous case. Okay, so here you have a triangle and we don't have any angles. So if I label this like A, B, C, you notice I cannot do any relationships or any proportion with the law of sines because for the law of sines again to work, you have to have an angle 
in relationship with the sign length. And in this case, I don't have any of them. So what do we do? Well, what we need to do is we need to solve for a missing angle, but I have three angles to choose from. So which one am I going to do? And before you just get to, well, just pick one, it doesn't really matter. We have to be diligent about this because remember I said, I want to avoid this ambiguous case. So how do we avoid the ambiguous case? And to answer that question, I think you just need to understand again, what exactly the ambiguous case can create or create as a problem for us. If we have a triangle here, and let's say we only have enough information for a angle, a side, and a side. Remember, this triangle can be created to have two different triangles, where therefore my angle big B could be obtuse, or big B could be acute, right? There's not enough information for us to know if we're dealing with an obtuse oblique triangle or an acute oblique triangle. Both of these variations could work based on our information. So what I'm here to kind of help you with is say, all right, what do we need to understand then about if we're given our A, and this would be B, and this would be A, and this would be our big B. So let's call that B1, B2, B1, B2. Okay, so the cool thing about log cosines is if you actually want to totally avoid the ambiguous case when you're given a problem with log cosines, just do the law of cosines the whole time. You never actually have to go back to using the law of sines. Use the law of cosines to find this angle, use the law of cosines to find this angle, and then obviously once you have two angles, right, you don't need to use the law of cosines a third time, you can just subtract these two angles from 180 to get C. But let's say you really like using the law of sines. You're really good at it. You just want to avoid having to deal with the ambiguous case. Here's what you need to do. Tip number three is to always use, when you have side, 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 always find the angle for the largest side first. Okay. So what that means is when you're using law of cosines, go ahead and find the largest angle first. So how do you know which one's the largest angle? Well, the largest angle is gonna have the opposing largest side. Since six is the largest side, I know that this angle is going to be the largest. Now, why is that important? Well, think about it this way, ladies and gentlemen. If this is going to be the largest side, whatever I use for law of cosines, it's gonna give me that angle, either acute or obtuse. You need to understand though, when we're doing the law of sines, you're only gonna give the acute answer. The ambiguous case, is telling you, hey, this obtuse angle might be a possibility as well. If B, let's say, is going to be, as we know, as our largest angle by law of cosines, we'll get that definitive value. However, when we go ahead and use our law of sines for A and C, we don't need to worry about the obtuse angle because if B is going to be already our largest angle, no matter what that is, it could be acute or it could be obtuse, we know that our second angle, the second option that we have for the ambiguous case is never going to be larger than B because we know B is always going to be the biggest. So B, using the law of cosines, is always gonna give you the exact angle. If you want to avoid law of sines, then just use stake, stick with the law of cosines. If you wanna use law of sines though, when solving a problem with law of cosines, use law of cosines first. For side, 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 always find the largest angle first. And then you don't need to worry about either of the other angles for law of sines of the ambiguous case because the obtuse angle is never gonna happen because it can never be bigger than the already largest angle that you just found. Whew, that was a big word side. Let's get into the next step. All right, so tip number five is gonna come when we have a triangle that is going to be in a relationship of side, angle, side. Now again, we can't use the law of sines in this case. We don't have a proportion to create. I only have one side length, I don't have the angle. One angle, don't have the side length. One side length, don't have the angle. So since I can't create a proportion, again, I have to use the law of sines. Now, unlike the previous example where I had side, 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 you always wanna find the largest angle first. But what do you do about in this problem? Now, there's only one way to go about using the law of cosines here, because whatever your angle is, that is going to be the side length that you're going to have to use for the law of cosines. So in this case, if I have A is 42 degrees, then therefore I'm gonna to need to solve for my side length A because that is enough information that I need to use the law of cosines. So wherever your angle is, that's going, always going to be the side length, but that's not where my tip is. I'll get to that in just a second. So if we were to go ahead and solve for A using the law of cosines, it would look like this. Now you go ahead and solve and you'd go ahead and take the square root of all these values. You go ahead and plug it in and you're gonna get some value. And I don't know what the value is. I'm just gonna make something up. Let's say my A is going to equal a 3.2, okay? Just making something up because I don't wanna make this video longer than it needs to be. Now, 
the best thing to do, if you want to avoid the ambiguous case, would, ben, would again then go to using the law of cosines again to find either B and C. But you can see like the law of cosines, it has a lot of things to be plugging into your calculator. There's a lot of opportunities to make mistakes. And that's why students like the law of sines as long as we can avoid the ambiguous case. So again, do we just pick then the largest angle to go first when we have something for side angle side? And no, here's the next tip. So now, if I already did the law of cosines once and I have side angle side, then what I'm actually gonna wanna do is find the smallest angle first to avoid. And the reason why that works is because here's my angle, or C, right? So angle C has opposing side five, angle B has an opposing side seven. So the reason why I want to use the smallest angle first is because I know that this angle, I've already figured out A and over here, right? This angle, I have my two cases. I could have the acute angle or I could have the obtuse angle. But the thing is, five is less than seven, right? So that means this angle C always has to be smaller than my angle B. So my two case solution, the acute angle is the only one that's ever gonna work, right? The obtuse version of this will never work because if C was obtuse, that would be the largest angle in the whole triangle. That means the side would be the largest side. Well, five is never gonna be larger than seven. So all you simply need to do when you're given side angle side, use the law of cosines to find your missing side, then always choose the smallest angle to use your law of sines. So then in this case, I would use the law of sines to solve for B. Whew. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that was five tips. Now you can use for the law of sines, the law of cosines. I hope that was helpful. Best of luck.